right, let's get into our study uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So turn with me, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to read some verses starting at verse 20 and uh, go down to uh, verse 24. And then we have a word of prayer. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And look with me at verse number 20. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 20. Paul, as he uh, gives his last minute instructions to these saints at Thessalonica in the first epistle, we'll look at the second one uh, in the future. He mentions um, things about, about the spiritual gifts. And so that's, that's where we're going to start here. This was an early epistle. It was the early uh, the infancy of the church, which is his body. And he, he mentions the spies not prophesying. So I'll talk more about that in a minute. But in verse number 20, he says, the spies not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. And then he says, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 24, the last, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord thanks. <clears throat> our gracious Heavenly Father, we do stop right now to give you thanks and praise for your holy word. Your holy word made flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the precious Savior, your glorious Son, the one who came to earth, lived that perfect life, under your righteous law there in Israel, and then died on that cruel and criminal Roman cross for our sins. We always reminded that he had no sin of his own to pay for, dear Lord, but thou hast made his soul an offering for sin. So we thank you for that wonderful sacrifice on Calvary's cross by your son, our precious Savior, the Lord Jesus. Father, we, we thank you for your holy word, the holy scriptures, the, the written word of God that we can trust, that we can, we can handle, we can have, we can read and study and we have the blessing of coming together with those of like precious faith to, to dig into the riches of your son, the Lord Jesus. Father, we pray that as we look into this study, as we look into the theme of this, the, the coming of the Lord and being blameless at that coming, that you give us great insight, understanding, and wisdom. And most importantly, a greater appreciation of your precious son, the glorious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his wonderful name we pray. Amen. Here in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, as, as I, let me remind you what the theme of the book is. The theme of the book is the hope of deliverance through his coming, through his return. And in this chapter, we see being blameless at his coming. Uh, the judgment seat of Christ is going to make us all blameless. We're all going to be up here before the Lord. We're going to have uh, our, our life in Christ looked at, and then every man shall have praise of God at the end. But you don't have to wait to be blameless and, and, and unblemable uh, without blame and, and, and have no blemish in, in his sight. If you look at verse number 20, let's start there. Uh, you see what Paul says, despise not prophesying. The book of 1 Thessalonians was written before the mystery was complete. Therefore, God had spiritual gifts in operation. Uh, look at verse 19, if you will. He says, quench not the spirit. That means don't put it out. The Spirit of God was operating supernaturally in that assembly. And when he says, despise not prophesying, these were the words that God was giving through the prophets in that particular local assembly. But he wanted them to be, uh, um, be prudent with, with the prophecies. He says, prove all things. Make sure that these prophecies are really from God. There was other supernatural things going on and words being said um, Look at, look at chapter number, look, go to 2 Thessalonians, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. There were other spiritual phenomena going on that weren't from the Lord. In verse number 2, 2 Thessalonians 2, 2. You said yeah, go to, go to the next book, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I just want you to see that we're, we're in a period of time where there was supernatural phenomenon both from the Lord and from satanic opposition. In verse number two, he says, this is first, second Thessalonians 2, 2. We're gonna, we're gonna look at it in detail when we get there soon, but he says, that she be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. You see where it says, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand? Now we're gonna get in, the, in detail, uh, if not this week, next week, 
with this passage. But there were other supernatural spirits going on with, with so-called prophesying. And it took the men in the body of Christ that God has put, the true prophets, to determine which one was actually true and which one was false. That's why in verse 21, go back to chapter 5, verse 21. That was the exact chapter we were checking out last time. I, I heard. See, it just works out that way. Uh, Lito told me that. Yep. And we may not get to it this week, but definitely by, by next Sunday. He says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. They were to use God's mind, the mind of Christ, and then, and then obviously the prophets had to test all those things out. We learned from 1 Corinthians. In verse 22, he says, abstain from all appearance of evil. That's just the, the good advice to, to not uh, bring uh, reproach to, 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 to the word of God, to the assembly. And then he says, verse number 23, which is our context here, here's, here's the gist of the chapter. He says, and the very God of peace, I like that. Uh, God is a God of peace. He, he wants, he likes peaceful order in the assembly. And the very God of peace sanctify, that sets you apart wholly unto him. And notice he says, sanctify you wholly. Not H-O-L-Y, although God does want us to be holy, right, set apart. This is in whole. You're the entire uh, part of you, holy, and I pray God, you're a whole, and, and what's the entire part, part of them? Spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when the Lord comes, it, it won't take the judgment seat of Christ to sanctify us. It doesn't have to. We can do it now. That's the process of sanctification. Now, while I'm thinking about it, is that a go ahead, holy sanctification, like the, the holy W-H-O-L-L-Y, similar to the perfection? Yes, yeah, it's, it's the entirety. Hey, what's up here? Uh, in, in, in entirety. Completely, right. And, and, the, and what, I, what I want to focus on a little bit today is, notice he said your whole spirit. Soul and body. Right, so your spirit. Number two, your soul, and then number three, your body. And he says, be preserved blameless. God cares about all three. Now, look at the order of that. Now, in the world, the heathen, when they talk about the, the parts of, 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 a, of a person, you know, personhood, they, they'll say like body, soul, and spirit, right, if they do mention three. But even out there, there's only, there are folks who think there's only your body and your soul, right? In fact, even in Christendom, I know uh, Hank Kennegraff and some of these other people out there, the Bible answered, he, 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 he believes that you're just a body and soul, which is strange to me because obviously they don't look at the Apostle Paul. Look at that verse again. He says, uh, verse number 23, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That's in your entirety. And he says, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord. And then look at verse 24. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. If you allow God to do it, he'll do it. Uh, let's look at these three, these three parts. Um, there are a number of Christendom cults and stuff who believe that you're just a two-part being, just a body and a spirit, uh, excuse me, a soul and a body. But that's not how God's word says, that's not what God's word says. And what I want to do is look at a few of these. Go all the way back to Genesis. Let's go back to the beginning. And Genesis chapter number 2. So let's, let's look at what the Bible says. Genesis chapter number 2. And um, we're going to start at verse 7. I'll give you time to get there. Wait, the first book of your Bible, Genesis 2. <clears throat> because the Bible makes it clear that we are a tripart being. We are a spirit a soul and a body. And what I'm going to show you is that we're made just like the Lord, okay? First, we're going to see how, how Adam was made, and then we'll see what God says about it before he, he, he makes them. In uh, Genesis chapter number 2, and if you look at verse number 7, notice what it says. How, this, is, this is explaining how God uh, made man. He says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Okay, so what would that be? That would be our, the physical body, right? That'll be his physical body. Yeah. Notice this. 
it says, and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. Now, what would that be? That would be the spirit right there. He gives a spirit. And then it says, and man became a living what? Soul. So you see the three parts. The body, that's the, what, he, what he formed. He actually put the, the dust and, and formed the man. You remember the Lord Jesus Christ when he would do miracles, particularly in the Gospel of John? He, he could take materials off the ground and he, he made an ear. He made an ear for man. He did things with men's eyes and so forth. Well, that was showing him as the God who created the man right here. But if you go over to chapter 1, look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. I've got a good verse that oh, lines yeah, up with that. Go ahead, Ryan. In Job 27, he says, All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. That's a good one. What was that, Job? Job 27, 3. Uh, so it's connecting the Spirit with that breath. That's how... We're going to look at it because I know they couldn't hear you. In a moment, we're going to go look at that. Thank you, Ryan. That's a really good one. And i got some other ones for the other parts. If, if you look at Genesis chapter number 1, look at verse 26. Genesis 126, and God said, let us. Now, interesting, this is the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And so, so both Adam and Eve had physical bodies. She came out of his body, but it was still the same material. She has a, a spirit. She has a soul, okay? Like Mary says, my soul does magnify the Lord and so forth. Um, when Rachel was having her son Benjamin, Genesis 35, it says, as her soul was in departing, for she died, okay? So you, you have spirit, soul, and body. And I want to show you some more about this. Let me look at, uh, I'm trying to keep my pages from flying apart. Laura says she's gonna, she wants me to give me Bible, but I got too many notes, okay? Every, every day I check it. All right. Bible in your life. Exactly. I know, I just wanted to make sure that it didn't fly away with the thing. Um, let me see here. Uh, so we saw Adam. You know what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes? He says the spirit, spirit of man when we die, goes back to God who gave it. Now the soul, that either goes to heaven today or to hell based upon your relationship with the Lord Jesus. If you're in Christ and, and if God holds you accountable, you're not innocent like a child or something. And then he talks about uh, like the Lord on the cross. When the Lord was on the cross, he tells the thief on the cross, he says, this day, he says, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. His soul went to paradise, which is in the heart of the earth, right? The son of man in the heart of the earth. But when he was on the cross, he says to the father, father, into thine hands, I commend my spirit. So his spirit went up to God. His soul went down into paradise. And obviously his body went into the tomb where they rolled the stone. So you can see those types of things as well. Um, but let me talk to you about the, the, the soul. Um, the Bible says that the Lord himself, God himself, has a soul. Interesting. Let us make man in our image. God is a spirit, John 4, but he has a soul and he has an vi outward visage, a body. Now, it's a different body. It's not a body of, of, of made of dust and of earth. Or blood. Or blood, but it's a body. Let me show you this issue of the Lord with, with the soul. Uh, go to Leviticus. Go back to Leviticus. Exodus, Leviticus. Yeah, it's it's uh, early in. You got, you got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 26. I'm going to show you some verses you, you probably, uh, you might be familiar with, maybe you're not. But, but when God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness, he meant that. chapter 26, Leviticus 26, and um, it's interesting that the Bible uses the same terms that we understand, how God made man, but if, like in his image and so forth. Let me show you a couple of things about the Lord 
with a soul. Uh, Leviticus 26, 11. These are some of the, 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 uh, the blessings and cursings that God promised Israel under the law. And, and um, he showed them how they could repent from their sins and how God would come back to them and so forth. Uh, if, in Leviticus chapter 26, and I want you to look with me at verse 11. Start at verse number, uh, verse 9. So he's telling them, if, if, if you keep his, if, well, you know what? Start at verse 3. Leviticus 26, verse 3. Because you need the context of it, right? Verse 3. Now, we always need the context. I want you to know where we're coming from. Look at verse number 3. If ye walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and what? Do, do them. them. Israel had to do them, the law. Practice them. He had to, they had to do it, right. So he goes through all these blessings he would give them. He would bless their fields and all. But go down to verse number uh, 7, 26 verse 7. And ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. He's going to give them military victory. Verse 8, to the, nation. to the nation of Israel. Yeah, he says, if you, if you obey me, here, here, these will be the blessings. He, they'll have their enemies on the run. Verse number 8. And five of you shall chase an hundred. And an hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. Like if they did what God said, he would help them, preserve them. Okay, we're talking about their preservation here. Okay, same thing Paul talks about with us. Watch this. Verse 9. For I will have, what? Respect unto you. God had respect for the, the nation of Israel when they obeyed him. Okay? Now, when Paul comes along, Peter says, I perceive that God is no respect of persons today. God changed the program. But back then, he had respect unto them. Verse 9. And make you fruitful and multiply you. Wait a minute. Doesn't that sound like what he said to Adam? Yeah. He says, be fruitful and multiply. Noah comes off the ark, Genesis 9, he says, be fruitful and multiply. He says to the nation of Israel, I'll make you fruitful and multiply you. And what? Verse 9, and establish my covenant with the world. Is that what it says? No, with you. Who's the you? Israel. This is so simple, people miss it. Verse 10, and ye shall eat old store and bring forth the old because of the new. In another place, he says, before you can even finish the old stuff, the new is going to come and overtake you. Right? Uh, Malachi, you know, they use these verses to make folks tithe, but he says, I, he says, I will open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. You won't have room enough to receive, right? You know, folks use that to get you to tithe, right? Yeah, yeah but that tithing is for Israel. But here's what I want you to see. Look at verse 11. And I will set my tabernacle among <laughs> you and my what? And my soul shall not abhor you. He said, wait a minute. It's just, this is God speaking. Look, his tabernacle, that's going to be first the tabernacle in the wilderness. It's going to be the temple. Look what he says in the next verse. And I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. That's a verse that says, my soul shall not abhor you. I got, an, I got a, another one. Go to the book of Judges. Go forward to the book of Judges. Deuteronomy. Then you have Joshua. Judges. Judges chapter 10, Judges 10, when God deals with each and every one of us, we're going to see is that he wants to deal with us in our entirety, in our spirit, our soul, and our body. Now, it's a little skewed today after Adam's sin. It's not in the order that Paul has it. The only way God can deal with us in that order is if you're in Christ in the mystery. I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Because there's understanding that you have to have about God's will. Paul constantly, it makes sense now, because that's what happened, why Paul always constantly talk about the understanding of your, your eyes, your understanding being enlightened, right? To understand his will. Because God wants to deal with us in this order. Spirit, but God deals with our spirit first, then our soul today, then our body. But the way he, he's called man to respond to him, quite frankly, is I'm going to talk to your spirit, do the word, or give you my word by the Holy Ghost or angel. Do what I tell you to do. If you don't understand it right now, don't worry about it. I'll give you understanding later. 
He didn't do that with Adam before the fall. When God was telling Adam to name the animals, and he goes, whatever name Adam gave, that was the name thereof. Adam was in tune with God's thinking on, on everything. He named it just like God had already named those animals in the spirit realm. He was operating spirit soul body. After the fall, man's understanding was darkened because of sin. And now by faith, you had to do what God says, whether you understood it or not. And I can tell you, I got a whole list of godly men, holy, righteous men, who didn't have one clue what God was talking about when he first told them. I'll give you one right off the bat. Job. Job was like, what's going on here? Jonah. Jonah says, what are you sending me to Nineveh? Jonah heard that word and says, I'm out. I'm going the other way. Simon bar Jonah. Peter, who was a type of Jonah, going out to that Gentile. He didn't understand. He said, what is going on here? These were all godly men. I got others who God told them to do something. Instead of reacting the way Adam did before he sinned, God says to their spirit, do something. Look at Abraham. God says to Abraham, leave everything, uproot, go to a land that I will tell you. He goes, I'm, up, I'm gone. Abraham learned the lesson. I was telling Krista on our drive of back from SoCal, I was saying, I was saying, I have a thought. I said, write this, that text it to me. <laughs> Abraham. God told Abraham to sacrifice his son. Abraham, he didn't say, well, what are you talking about, Lord? But he didn't understand. Here's what he understood. Just do what God says. Just do what he says. Obeying he had a, he, Obeying was important. Obeying was important. But can I tell you how God wants to deal with man? No, he was dealing with Adam before the, you know, he, he, he sinned. God wants us to obey him not because he's bigger than us and more powerful than the Almighty. Because we understand him. He wants us to, to, to work with him in understanding. That's how the Lord Jesus Christ, God dealt with the Lord Jesus Christ like this. The Lord understood the Father. He, he understood him. Now, look at uh, what I tell you, Judges. Judges 10, verse 16. Start at verse 15. Judges 10, 15. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. Listen, God used the pain and trouble of the enemies when Israel sinned against them to get their attention. Now look at verse 16. I love this verse. And they put away the strange gods from them. Isn't one of the Ten Commandments not to have, you're not to have any other gods before me? You're not to have idols? And serve the Lord. Now watch this, what it says, when they served the Lord. And his soul was grieved for the what? Misery of Israel. Get that? God says, boy, they're going through a lot. When God says that, you're going through a lot. He, his soul was like, oh, that's a lot for them to go through. I got to rescue them. It grieved him to see them doing it. It grieved, it says the misery of Israel. I mean, it was like they were back in Egypt. Remember, they were getting blasted by the Egyptians. To the point Moses killed an Egyptian. He killed a man. He couldn't take it anymore. He just killed him and hid him in the sand and ran. He, he was a deliverer. He, well, Moses gained that, you right on, though. He gained that understanding after 40 years of looking around going, I look more like them than I do them. His heart and his mother, Jacobet, was teaching him this stuff when he was a baby. Because she got paid to take care of her own son. How about that? Right. She gives birth. Said, God, I'm not killing this boy. Put him in a... You know, you know what Moses' name is in, in, in the Egyptian lore? Um, was it, was it again? At the U Museum of Science and Industry over in Chicago. Was that where we went? They were doing a, a little thing about Egyptian history. And they mentioned a man named Tut Moses. means drawn out of the water. Oh, you know how King Tut... Heard that. They, they, they called Moses Tut Moses. Interesting. They know of Moses. Well, Moses was, was put in the, in, the, in, the, in the Red Sea. Pharaoh's daughter grabbed him, says, Daddy, not this one. Okay, keep that one. And then you need a woman who's, you know, nursing, who we've got a good nurse. Well, we know a woman, says his sister Mary. We know a woman. And they said, well, pay her, too. <laughs> so she, got, she gave her son to God and got him back and then paid to take care of her son. Now, it was temporary. She weaned him and stuff. 
he went on to be prince in Egypt until he killed that man and ran away for 40 years. Um, one more, Jeremiah. We've got three witnesses here. Jeremiah chapter 32, so go forward. Uh, you want to help her, uh, Nan Doty? Yeah, Jeremiah 32. God wants to deal with us as, as members of the body of Christ how he wanted to deal with Adam, how he dealt with the Lord. It takes time, though. And like Sister Lord said in that, 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 that card, you need to know the mystery. Because the way God is going to deal with you in your spirit, soul, and body and preserve it blameless is through the mystery. And by the way, I, I, we'll, we'll look at that verse before we head back to our text too. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 32. Go ahead. See, that comes in handy, right, man? That little thing. <laughs> Jeremiah 32. Give, give us some time. Jeremiah 32. Verse. Chapter 32. Now, if you're familiar with 32 and 33, this is the new covenant, right? He's going to. So let's start. Let's start in uh, verse 37. Start at verse 36. I got a little paragraph mark there. Everybody got Jeremiah 32, 36. Look what he says. Now, now therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city, whereof ye say, it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. What's his promise? Here we go. Behold, I will gather them out of all countries whither I have driven them in mine anger. Why did, why did God, why did he scatter the people of Israel? He was angry at them. He says, this is my land and you pollute my land. And for 70 years, because they didn't do the Sabbaths properly, they didn't let the land rest every seven years. They, all the things God told them from Moses, they didn't do. So God says, fine, get off the land. And he left in the land, the fatherless, the orphan, the widows, and the poor. He says they get to stay and have the blessings of the land. The rest, he took all the nobles, all the kings, all the princes, that's what Daniel and all, he took all them and took them to Babylon in chains, but left the poor and the fathers and the widows which he had mercy on. Now watch this. Where I'm at, uh, verse 37, right? Behold, I will gather them out of all the countries which I have driven them in mine anger, and in my what? Fury. And in great wrath. I mean, he's making it clear. He's upset, right? Yeah. I will bring them. A, a, by the way, he made a promise to their father Abraham, so he didn't forget. I will bring them again unto what? This place, particularly Jerusalem, Israel. I will cause them to dwell how? Safety. Safely. Now, later, we're going to see when they say peace and safety, then sudden sudden destruction. They're going to make a covenant with the Antichrist. We'll see that in chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. Here we go. Verse 38, and they shall be my people, and I will be their, what? God. And I will give them one heart and one way. I like that, one way. Do you know the Lord Jesus? He was called the what? The way. The way they were known amongst the people of Israel, the little flock, was those of the way, or that way. I will give them one way. I am the way. You, you ever know why he said that? It's because of that verse. He just says, I am the way. They say, Lord, show us the way. He says, I am the way. Who answers like that? Lord, show us the way. I am the way. And by the way, I'm the truth and the life. <laughs> oh, man. That's why he said it. I'll give them one way. That's the Messiah. Look, look at verse 39. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me. How long? Forever. For the good of them and of their children after them. Verse 40. And I will make an everlasting covenant with who? Them. There's no replacement theology. The body of Christ didn't get the, the covenant promises of Israel. They're all for Israel. Here we go. But I will, not turn away from them. But I will put, uh, that I will not turn away from them to do them what? Good. But I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good. Do you see this goodness, God? What is God's glory? What is his glory? His mercy. His mercy, his goodness. Remember he says to Moses, Lord, show me thy glory. 
He says, yeah, I'll let all my goodness pass by. God is good. God is good. That's what it means, the the glory of God. He's good. He's goodness. Watch this. Verse 41. Yeah, I will rejoice over them to do them good. I will plant them in this land assuredly with, I love this, with my whole what? My whole heart and with my whole what? Oh. With my whole soul. God is a spirit, John chapter 4. The Lord Jesus Christ tells the woman at the well, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him how? In spirit and in truth. But God has a soul. And according to Daniel, let's look at the last one, Daniel. Uh, before we go to Daniel, go, I want to, Ryan, that's a, great, that's a great verse. Go back to Job. If you find the Psalms, you can find Job right yes, before. before. Uh, that's for Nan. Go, go to uh, Job. Job. The book of Job. It's it's entire. Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. He says, my whole heart and soul. He's saying every fiber of my being. You see his intensity, right, Uh, Ted? He says, with everything. Now think about this. God is saying, with everything I have, I'm going to fulfill this. That's why nobody's going to get that. God hasn't. The gifts and calling to God without repentance. He hasn't changed his mind about giving Abraham the seed, that land. I don't care who tries to withstand. You're going to go up against the living God, the almighty, and he's putting everything he's got into it. You're in trouble. You ain't getting it. Um, what is it? Job 27. Sorry about that. Huh? Job 27. Look at Job chapter 27 and uh, verse 3. Start at verse 1. Job 27, 1, more of a Job continued his parable and said, As God liveth, who have taken away my judgment. See, remember I said Job didn't grasp it at first. Job was the most righteous man on earth at that time. He's the grandson of Jacob. You got Jacob. One of his 12 sons is Issachar. Issachar's son is Job. Okay, when you look at the Chronicles. All right, here's Job. He says, he take away my judgment. God doesn't care about me. He, he's harming me for no reason. <laughs> See, Job, Job, Job didn't have that understanding yet. Okay, but keep going. Verse two, as God liveth who have taken away my judgment and the almighty who vexed my, what? Soul. Huh. God allowed Satan to harm Job's physical body. God, he says, you're vexing my soul, Lord. Now watch his spirit. Thank you, Ryan. This is a really good one. Mm-hmm. All the while my breath is in me, and the spirit of God is where? In my nostrils. Job recognized how God created Adam. That's our, it, It's come down. That our, our very life, his spirit, the, the spirit is what animates. It's what gives, animals have a spirit. By the way, cats, dogs, animals, they have obviously physical bodies, have a body, and they have a spirit. And what reason they call animals, what animates them, what animates them is this, the spirit. What they don't have is a what? Souls. No other creatures have souls except us. Except, people. except us and God. Angels don't. Angels are just spirits. They have bodies, but bodies made of fire. They're just spiritual. But no other, how unique is, are we? We're the only beings outside of God himself with a soul. Isn't that wonderful? That's how intimate he is with man. That's why the Lord Jesus became a man. He didn't become an angel. He, he, didn't, he didn't die for angels. Angels have no redeemer. Obviously, beasts of burden, beasts, animals... They're made for the humanity down here in this world. Folks love their dogs, boy, here in California. That's all I'm going to say. They love their dogs. But the little thing you see is this little spirit. They've got an animal spirit. Ecclesiastes says the same thing. The spirit. Now, oh, yeah, I better say this. The animals, their spirits don't go up to God because God didn't make them. They go to the ground. They go right back into the earth. 
they served their purpose uh, for cat 20 years, a dog 15 years, whatever, and and they, they, you, they you, you bury them, they're there, and they served their purpose. He gave them for our earthly pleasure. Yes, he gave them for our earthly pleasure, and, and uh, beast of burden like ox and stuff, but uh, domesticated animals and stuff. It, for, for us, it's for us, right? Mm -hmm. And by the way, dogs are very useful because they can, they're snipping, you know, they help man solve crimes and Dark stuff, right? Like sure. The so they, days. yeah, they do all types of stuff. Sheep, but sheep herders and stuff. Sheep herders, yeah, that's right. You got the, 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 the we saw a little, uh, what kind of dog was that, Ryan? That Labrador, Labrador. Labrador was the mix. Yeah, he has a nice food dog. So they can serve a purpose, but when they die, their bodies, you know, you bury them, whatever, or send them to cremation, but their little spirits go back, and they've done their purpose for, the, for their little life, okay? They just, you just love them. But man, every spirit of man, even the heathen, go back to God that gave. It goes back to God, the, the one who originally gave man spirit. Now your soul goes up here if you're in Christ. If you're a heathen, you're not in Christ. You're still in Adam. You go to hell, to the flame. Hey, Ron, I know and that... Uh, and then the body goes into the ground or cremated or whatever. I've asked, see. I, I talked to a few people about this. I think we talked about it in the past. And Angie was ask, asking me about this the other day. About potentially okay. if you had, a, if you had a, a pet that you really loved in this life, in, uh, in eternity future there... If oh, you yeah, if you wanted to like resurrect your your pet and have him with you again, I'm sure the Lord would would allow yeah, a member yeah, of the body do what you want. To do sure, that. we did talk about that, especially with Matt. So <laughs> yeah, with, yeah. With, with Kai, yeah. he, the first thing Matt's gonna do, we get there and be like, "Judge and see the Christ." Come on, Kai, here we go. <laughs> his dog, that man loves his dog. I don't get it, man's best friend. But yes, uh, potentially, it, it means doesn't. But because of who we are in Christ, and we we will be sons and daughters of God, as He calls us in Second Corinthians. Uh, if you had a beloved animal like that, I don't see God not allowing you. you know. Right, anything that would bring you joy would bring and him joy. joy right? Exactly. All right, so Daniel chapter 7. Wait, can we go? Why did he use the word nostrils? Because remember, because uh, he used that with Adam. In Genesis 2, 7, mm -hmm. he breathed into his nostrils. Oh. That's the air, the no air. he got okay. the air in him. You know how they put the, man? Is yeah. in my nostrils, okay. He, and by the way, he used nostrils because that's the same term used in Genesis 2 7 for Adam. Is where the breath is. Is where the breath is, right. Okay. Uh, you can, yeah, you can resuscitate somebody just by getting it into his airstream. Uh, Daniel chapter 7, before we go back, Daniel chapter 7. That's almost, yeah, it's almost at the end. Daniel chapter 7. And uh, look what he says. Daniel has a vision. He could see into the heavens, okay? They open up the heavens for him. He has this vision. Ezekiel. You got Ezekiel? Daniel? Ezekiel. No. Daniel comes after Ezekiel. <laughs> Daniel 7. Oh, Daniel chapter 7. You got 7? Oh, no, it's not. That's all right. Go, go forward a page. Yep. Daniel chapter 7. And, and look at verse number... Daniel has this vision about the future and so forth, okay? And then here comes uh, a vision of the Messiah. Verse number nine. Seven, nine. Seven, nine. I beheld, everybody got it? I beheld the thrones. I beheld till the thrones. I got too much writing around my, my words. <laughs> I beheld till the thrones were cast down. And you, you see this? The Ancient of Days. Is it capitalized in your God. Bible? Yes. yes. Yeah, that, that's, that's a vision of God the Father. Hold on a second. Did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his what? Head like pure wool. And his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire, and fiery stream issue forth, and so forth and so on. Okay? Um, Look at verse number 13, just for time's sake. Uh, Daniel 9, uh, 9 13, uh, 7, 13, 7, 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. Who would that be? Jesus. That's the Lord Jesus. Came with the clouds of heaven. That would be uh, the angels. And came to the Ancient of Days. So this is the Messiah coming to the Father. And the Ancient of Days has a 
head, he has hair, he has torso, arms, legs, everything. He has, he has a body. Now, again, God's body is a spiritual body. The angels have a spiritual body, but they're still a body. Look at this. Verse 13, and I saw the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they, the clouds, brought him near before him, and he was given dominion. One more. Uh, verse 21, 721, I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So I want you to see, I wanted you to see that the Son of Man represents the Lord Jesus going with the angels to the Ancient of Days. And, that, and that, that's, a, that's a, like a, a form of a man sitting on a throne. It's the, it's the Father. God himself has both spirit, soul, but yeah, that's the future. That's future. You know what, Dodi? That could be. I, I, I won't go into it. She asked, "Was that future?" That could be when, in John chapter nineteen or twenty, I remember John chapter twenty. You remember he resurrected when the Lord's resurrected, right? Mary Magdalene sees him. She wants to touch him. He says, "No, Mary, don't touch me." Send it to the Father. I have not ascended yet. But go tell my brethren that when I'm done. And then later in the chapter, Thomas is able to touch him. Yeah. We believe that that was that ascension. Because remember, he's like a high priest. He could not be unclean, ceremony unclean. So what, what, what probably happened is that's when he did this ascension, goes into the temple, does his you know, sim symbolism and so forth, doing everything. And then he returns. So that's, that's our speculation. Because... This, because you know he, he in, in Acts chapter 1, he ascends to the heavens with the angels right before their eyes. But he's saying that the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Not well, yeah, he's going into the future then. Yeah, yeah, that's the future. Yeah. So that could be, remember Daniel, just like Revelation, kind of cycles around. It'll give you some information and go back and stuff like that. So I'll talk to you more about that later, Dodie, but that's a good question. But anyway, that's an ascension. The Ancient of Days has this body, not a physical body, a spiritual body, but he does have a body, okay? Now, go back to our text. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And so, what God desires for us, what Paul is, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, what Paul is praying for, You know, Paul talks about the mind of Christ. I love it. Your mind, it, where, your, where your mind exists is there in your soul, okay? By the way, your soul, that's truly who you are. Your physical body will one day perish or be changed, right? Your spirit will go back to God who gave it. You only have a spirit to live in this world or this world. You will have the Holy Spirit. You have that now. Who you are, who you are, who we are, every soul is unique. Every soul. Personality. It's our per it, it, literally, that's what it is. Personality. I call it personhood. It's who you are. Every soul is unique. When a baby is conceived, that spark, they can do it with technology. I love how God catches them. They get so good with technology. They can see all this. And right when the egg and sperm come together, and it's a spark. It's called the spark of divinity, spark of life. You know what that spark is? A soul coming to life. God did. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Still happens to this day. And now that little thing in there that sparked to God, it's a soul. It's a person. It's not an amoeba. It's not a little whatever the, they want to call it. It's someone. It's a soul. It's a God. And that soul, if it's killed, has to be avenged. And if you don't have the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, I feel, ooh, the doctors, the nurses, the parents who make the choices. I'm not trying to get anybody, I'm just being honest. You need the blood of Christ to cover that murder. 
That's the only way you get out of it. And the more innocent the blood that you shed, the only more innocent blood than these babies is the Lord Jesus himself. That's it. This is serious business. And why is that such a big thing? It's, it's spiritual currency. Spiritual currency. It's power. And so they shed the innocent blood of babies to give power to darkness. And the only power that's greater than that is the power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. That's why... That, 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 why people just so want to kill these babies and all? Because spiritual currency gives power to darkness. And the only thing to stop that is the power of the Lord, the light of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's his innocent blood. It's the only thing better than that. But they will be avenged. It will be avenged. Every one of them. Every one of them. Look at this. Verse 23. Paul says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, completely, in, in entirety. But wait a minute. Paul doesn't want you to wait to the judgment. He says, and I pray God, I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be what? Preserved how? Blameless, not, he says, unto, unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That has to do with the rapture. He wants to make sure you're blameless as, as, as you could be is, when you get to the judgment seat. Is that the same as our position? This would be our practice, Doni. Great question. Okay. This is a process of sanctification, okay. growing in the mystery over time, uh, developing the mind of Christ. That's what I want to talk to you about. I got James 1, verse 4. Let me see why I got that right there. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting not to... Oh, okay, I, I, see this, I must have been looking at it. It's the same word, entire. <laughs> Let me show you something. That issue of uh, 1 verse 4, I was just reading why I had a note there. Uh, that whole is entire. It means entirety. Um, look at verse 24, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. You know, Paul, didn't Paul say the same thing to the Corinthians? He that hath begun a good work, no, uh, the, the, he's, sorry, he talked about blameless. Uh, Philippians, he says, he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. God is in the business of dealing with us like this. But even our apostle Paul had to learn. Paul started having God deal with him this way, but it, it didn't, didn't come right away. For example, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Go over to 2 Corinthians 12. I'm going to show you as we end that the Apostle Paul got to a point where he was operating with God just like this. But he wasn't always just like that. I'll show you what I mean. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Now I can tell you I'm not there yet. It, it, it's, it's a constant thing. It took Paul decades to, to, to develop this mindset. It's called the mind of Christ. Willing to suffer for the Father's sake, willing to do it, knowing what, what it's about. The Lord Jesus Christ did. It says, for the joy that was set before him, a joy has to do with, even if you don't possess something now, you know you will. In his case was the kingdom. So he was willing to sit on that cruel and Roman cross and go through his passion, as Luke called, and get beaten, spit upon, and crown of thorns, this stick on his head, all that. And he was just, oh, Father, this is for you. This is for you. This is for you. The only thing he didn't want to do was be separated from the Father. He, he did say, Father, if it be possible. Why have you forsaken me? Well, that's when he, that's after the, he was suffering, though, as far as his soul. He was separated, right? But before, remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, right, the, the press. He says, Father, if it be possible, if it be thy will, take this cup from me. Right. He understood what, we, what, he was, what was happening. Yes, he, he wasn't operating with not understanding in his soul. He's saying, we're going to be separated because of the sin that you're putting right. upon me. I did I chose to put upon me, but he didn't like it. Who wants to be separated from God? It is human to say, 
his man, right, his good point. He said, I don't want to be separated from you, Father. What child does, really, okay? You take a child away from their father or father away from their child. Who wants to be separated? Well, how much more him? He's been with the father forever. So his, as a man, Jesus says, I don't want this, Lord. But then how, how, does, how do you operate by faith? Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. But he knew it. He knew it, right? So for the joy that's set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, knowing that he would receive his father's kingdom, right? Look what the apostle Paul did in 2 Corinthians. Now, this is an early epistle, right? 2 Corinthians 12. Second, this is fantastic. 2 Corinthians 12. What chapter? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 1, 2, yep. Verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, he mentioned all those revelations and will come, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. It says in, in, in other parts to harass or to vex in Numbers 33, 35. A messenger of Satan to buffet me. That's to keep him humble, right? To keep him down. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, Paul knows that now. At the time, he wasn't sure what was going on. He was like, Job, like, what's going on here, Lord? Verse 8. How do we know? For this thing I besought the Lord, how many times? Thrice. Thrice. Or that means three times. He says, uh, maybe you didn't hear this prayer, Lord. Let me come back to you. And he said again. And he says, well, God, you know, uh, maybe he didn't hear me. But I know he's thinking, well, he always hears me. He can hear it. I kind of go through his thinking, but he says, I'll pray about it again. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. Now, he did it too as a witness, two or three witnesses. As a Jew, he had to have three witnesses. Maybe Lord didn't hear me, so I'm going to say it again. Maybe one more time. Okay. Verse 9. And he said unto me, my what? My grace. My grace. Grace. What is God trying to teach us about his grace? My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength, Paul, is made perfect. It's complete. In weakness. Then Paul got it. That changed his life. From that point on with that thing, Paul began to accelerate his understanding about God's will. And he understood that all oh, God is trying to magnify his grace today. Why is there an attack on this grace message? Because that's what God wants. It's the dispensation of grace. Paul started operating like this. And so when he, he sees, he says, yeah, we want the saints to see that. God, by the spirit of God, had Paul write that in 1 Thessalonians, early epistle. But he says it's a process. He dealt with Adam's spirit, soul, body. He started dealing with, with men through their spirits, tell them, think about the stuff he had folks do. He says, go and take your son and sacrifice him. That's not rational to a man. You gave me this son. What are you talking about, Lord? But then Abraham obeyed. Now what happened? Hebrews says, as he's doing in, in the obedience, he says, God will raise him up. He, got, he did it, and God raised him up. God would have the prophets of Israel do crazy stuff sit on one side of their body and then turn over to the other side for days. He, he'd have, he said, now go heal Naaman, have him dip into the Jordan River, that dirty water, seven times. And they're like, what are you talking about dipping in this dirty water? Seven times? Do you want to be healed of leprosy? And what that was is the seven years of it. Tribula. It was all type of symbol. We know now. They didn't understand, but it, it came with time. The mind of Christ. You're in 1 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians, go back to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul, even with the Corinthians, in an early epistle said, here's God's plan for us. Watch this. The natural man, man operating in his physical carny, uh, carnal nature. When I say carnal, not in a bad way. Just his, his fleshly nature, how, who, is, who he is naturally. Um, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. <clears throat> Who asked me about this last week? About was it you, Lita? Were you asking me about? It was either you or Mike? 
if none of the princes of this world knew, or had they known it, they would not crucify the Lord of glory. Maybe it's Ted. Maybe it's Ted. It was you, Ted. We're talking about the mystery here, right? The wisdom of God in the mystery. Uh, look at look at verse uh, First Corinthians two, uh, verse number six. First Corinthians two six. Howbeit we speak what wisdom. wisdom among them that are perfect. So Paul's talking about some spiritual mature saints here. Not the Corinthians, but when he's around with other saints. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, the, the, the satanic rulers, that comes to what? No. Not. But we speak the wisdom of who? The wisdom of God. Do you understand that the God of heaven wants to share his wisdom with, with some folks like us? We speak the wisdom of God in a what? Mystery. mystery. But it's according to the revelation of the what? Mystery. mystery. The mystery. Just like Laura, she says, you got to know the mystery. Okay? Keep reading. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained what? Before the world unto our glory. God wants us to share in this. He wants us to know this. Here we go. Verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They would have let the Lord Jesus have the earth and they would have kept the heavens. God had a plan to restore the heavenly places back in, under his dominion through Christ that Satan and his angels did not see. In fact, no, nobody saw it but God until he revealed it to Paul. Now, verse 9. But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear, what? Heard. Neither have entered into the heart of men, man the things which God hath prepared for them that what? love him. Ah. But God hath, what? Revealed them unto us by his spirit. Now, Paul actually means spiritual gifts at that time. He, he was revealing this stuff in increments. Now. Now the word of God is complete. The spirit of God wrote Paul's words down for us. Okay, keep going. For what man know? I'm sorry, verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit, capital, that's the Holy Spirit, searches what? All things, yea, the deep things of God. As we start to learn these deep things of God, we start to understand his mind about things. Watch this. Verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man? Save the spirit of man which is in him. That's what we all have, naturally. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but who? The spirit of God. So if we want to know the things of God, we have to have the spirit of God reveal them, right? Let's look at it. Verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. Ah, what did God give us as members of the body? But the spirit which is of who? God. Why did he do it? That we might what? Know the things that are freely given to us. Think of when you see that word freely, think grace that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak. Not in the words. Where's God's mystery information wisdom? It's in words. Not in the words which man's wisdom teaches. Yeah. Or, or just the a religion, mother, which is in course of this world. Or just the, the wisdom of this world, philosophy and vain deceit and all. Listen, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. It's talking about these spiritual men as we look at these things. Verse 14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are what? Spiritually discerned. That's, called, that's the spiritual understanding discernment. By the way, that comes with time, everybody. That comes with study of the, the mystery of God. Now watch this. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. He's able to make spiritual judgments, right? Discernment. Paul says that your, that your love may abound more and more in all judgment, right? Keep going. Yet he himself is judged of no man. Interesting. When you operate with the mind of Christ, no man can sit in judgment upon you on your, on your choice. Look, because the way he says in verse 16, for who, who have known the mind of who? The Lord. 
that he may instruct him. Who can sit and tell the Lord, hey, this is what I want you to do? But we have the what? The mind of Christ. And what he means by that, we have access to it through his word. And what life in, in, in as a grace believer is, is now, over the course of time, having our whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless till he comes. How do we do that? It's through developing the mind of Christ through the doctrine of the mystery. That's why it matters what, what you study from the word. It's, it's great to study the Psalms and the Proverbs and all the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's just fine. But that's not the highest priority. The mystery is found in these books, Paul's books, Romans through Philemon. That's the doctrine of the mystery right there. That's what we need to focus on right there. It doesn't mean you neglect all the other parts, uh, Genesis through Acts and uh, Hebrews through Revelation. But it means your focus, your primary focus, is developing that because that's what's going to make your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. And Paul learned that as we end. The Apostle Paul went from saying, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Please give me understanding to saying, I know what he's doing. Look at two passages. Ephesians 3. Philemon. Ephesians 3. Let's go to Ephesians 3 first. Ephesians chapter number 3. After yeah, after Galatians. This is one of Paul's later epistles. He now has the revelation of mystery complete here. Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. Now, it's, it's a passage that you should be very familiar with as, as, as a grace believer. But I want to focus on one point here that we really don't even pay that much attention to, but it's, it's, it's really important what he says here. Verse 1. Ephesians 3, verse 1. For this cause and that's how God is building this new agency called the body of Christ with both Jew and Gentile in one body if you just for this cause I Paul the what the prisoner of who of Jesus Christ why did he say I'm the prison of the Roman Empire I'm a political prisoner I'm being persecuted why all of a sudden at the end of his life I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ Living sacrifice. He understood what he what was going on. He got it. God gave Paul full understanding that listen, the things you're going through are for your benefit and for the, the, the body. Watch this. Is fruit abound in your account? Okay, watch this. That's right. Verse verse one. For this cause I Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you who? Gentiles. He says, I'm going through this for you guys. If you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me, given me to you, or how that by revelation he made known unto me the what? The mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand. Why is Paul saying, I want you to understand this mystery? Because he's trying to preserve your whole spirit, soul, and body. Watch this. Uh, whereby when you read ye may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by what? The Spirit. The Spirit. Remember he just said, the Spirit's going to show you all this. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise, that's life eternal in the kingdom, in Christ by the gospel, the gospel of the grace of God, whereof I am made a minister. See, Paul's Paul saying, get this, everybody. It's associated with my ministry. You got to teach my ministry. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints. Paul still saw himself as that persecutor of the little flock who didn't deserve it. But what's grace? Undeserved kindness, right? Unmerited favor. 
Verse 8, unto me, here's my definition of the grace message somebody has. Unto me, that's Paul, who am less than the least of all saints. There's his humility as a man. He magnifies his office, but not himself. Is this grace given that I should preach among the what? Gentiles, the unsearchable. That means you can't find it in the Old Testament. Riches of who? Christ. And to make all men see, Jew and Gentile, what is the fellowship of the mystery? Why does he keep mentioning the mystery? Because that's how God's going to do it. From which, uh, uh, make, verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid where? In God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers where? In heavenly places. Listen, the angel, angelic realm wondered how God's going to do this thing. They know he could, and they knew he would one day. They didn't know when and how. Now they know. Uh, uh, verse 10, 10, to the intent that now into the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by who? Us. The church. That's what you spotted. The manifold, the multifaceted. They saw how he would reclaim the earth. It was all prophesied and written down in the Old Testament. But now they understand the manifold wisdom of God, the wisdom of God and the mystery. And guess what? It's been his purpose all along. Verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. On the way to Philemon, stop by Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. Another one of Paul's latter epistles. The next book. Philippians 4. Yeah. You know what Paul's attitude about suffering was after that whole thing with the trust? He said, if it comes, come. Let it come. It'll be fruit of my God and my account. Whatever. If I have to suffer for the mystery, praise the Lord. That was his attitude. Is that a natural attitude of a natural man? No. no. Does your soul say, yeah, bring it on. Bring all the suffering. No. <laughs> That's a spiritual man there. That's a man who knows what God is doing. That's a man who's who operated with God like, like Adam was for, for temporarily. Laboring. How the Lord. That's right. He understood something. Because we're going to we're end this in... Uh, in uh, Philemon, but I, I'm going to stop by a second. Too. Look at Philippians chapter 4. Watch this. As Paul was uh, laboring in the ministry, as, as Madison said, he was laboring for the Lord. He suffered. He, he suffered lack of resources at times. You labor for the Lord in the ministry, that, that's your life. <laughs> Let me tell you. Christ can tell you. But you learn some things. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Verse 10. Philippians 4.10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Why bring up the Lord? Because this is, this is going to the judgment seat. That now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. He says, you guys appreciate me and you're taking care of me. When we end in our, in our text in chapter 5, that's a thing. Wherein ye were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Look at his graciousness. It's, he says, I know you guys stopped just because, you know, you lacked opportunity. You didn't know where I was or something. He's been gracious to me. <laughs> Verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have what? Learn. Learned. Learned. I've learned something from God. It's a process. It's a process. It's a learning process. Keep reading. In whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Dodie, we, you said it. Remember in 2 Corinthians, he said, for when I am weak, he didn't say when I am weak, then I am strong. You know what he said? For when I am weak, then am I strong? The weakness, that he, the humility he had to the suffering for Christ's sake strengthened him with the Lord's strength. The grace of the message was my strength. What's my grace is my strength. Right. You know what Paul says? I've learned, verse 11, in whatsoever state I am, will never be content. Verse 12, I know both how to be abased. That's in the low life. I know how to bound. Seasons of life. Everywhere in all things I am what? Instructed. Who instructed Paul? The Lord. The Lord Jesus did. Both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and at times what? To suffer need. And this is our fantastic verse. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You know Paul learned the lesson when I am weak. Then am I strong? His grace is his strength 
He strengthens me by his grace. That's his sufficiency. Mm. Uh, second, go to 2 Corinthians. So, no, no, so 2 Timothy. Go forward to 2 Timothy. We're almost done. 2 Timothy. <laughs> Look what Paul said at the end of his life. Remember he called himself the prisoner of Jesus Christ? He's like, eh, I'm going through this for you guys. Huh. 2 Timothy 2.9. Paul talks about his, his gospel where he suffers. 2 Timothy 2.9. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. Prison. Yeah. But what did he know about the word of God? Can't bind the word of God. It's kind of ironic. You can bind it in a book. You can, you, know, you can bind the word of God in a book. That's about the only bond that you can do. Put it together in a book. That's kind of ironic. God has a sense of humor. You can bind it in a book. You know what that makes me think of? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Remember when they were um, spreading his garment? Yes. And how it mentions that it has no, it's made from the neck and with no bound? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, with, that's what yeah. I think about right there. That's a good point. That's a good point. And, that, and as you mentioned that, remember I just said that even his apostles, they didn't understand, they didn't have understanding. Do you know right before he was about to go to, to the cross, he tells his apostles, the son of man is going to be delivered unto the Gentiles. He should be beaten and spitefully treated, spit it upon. He will be die, and on the third day he rise again. Mm -hmm. They look at each other and say, what's this guy talking about over here? Mm -hmm. Peter was like, no, Lord, it won't happen. He tried to kill a man. Mm -hmm. It says they understood none of these things. It was hid from them, and they were afraid to ask him what he was talking about. That's because they, they, were, they, they didn't understand. They didn't have understanding. Now, after his resurrection, what happens? Oh, they all get it now. Right. Who helped him? The Holy Spirit helped him. Mm -hmm. Peter, went, Peter went from trying to kill a man to keep him from dying to telling Israel in Acts 2 and 3 and 4, he just, he laying it out there for him, right? He's Stephen, giving it to him. Now they're operating how God made man operate. But that doesn't happen naturally. Right. You need the Spirit of God and the Word of God to... Facilitate that. He had to go to the Father in order for the Son Spirit to come on. Him. Correct. The Father, the, the Lord had to send. He to, had to yes, send right. that. Amen. He said, "When I go, I'll send the Comforter." The, the Comforter. That's right. That's right, though. Look at Second Timothy two. When Paul was in prison, he says in verse nine, "Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure what all things for the elect's sake." That they might, that's a, the body, that they may also obtain. He's looking for the future now. This salvation which is in Christ Jesus, remember he put Christ first, focus on the cross, with eternal glory. Paul says all this suffering is for others' sake. He, he, Ryan mentioned how that, that living sacrifice, Paul understood that. He says, you know what? I'm a sacrifice for others. Uh, you go to Philemon. Go to Philemon. Look what he says. I, I just, I, I, I love how he talks about himself now. This, this little latter epistle, Philemon, verse nine. Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech you, being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of who? He saw himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I'll let you get it, though. You see, verse nine. The Apostle Paul, he didn't, he didn't say, man, I'm a prisoner of, of the Roman Empire. The speak of Nero. He says, uh, it's right, it's right uh, at the Titus. So you were in second, yeah, it's right at the Titus. Okay. Yeah. Look at verse 9. Check this out. He says, where were we in Ephesians? Hold on, right there now. Keep going. It's, it's only one page. So it's really hard. Verse 9. Verse 9. Paul says, Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, being such a one as Paul the Aged. He started out as a young man named Saul who wrote to Damascus. Now he's Paul the Aged, 30 plus years later. Watch. <clears throat> and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Why is he constantly reminding them in his latter epistles he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ? Because he said, hey, man, that's suffering you got. They were worried about the apostle. 
It wasn't good to be in a Roman prison. They were worried about him. It's dark and cold. He says the Lord in 2 Timothy 1, he says, The Lord give mercy to the house of the missile force, for he was not afraid, ashamed of my chains. He offered fresh me. Paul knew that he was a prisoner not of the Roman Empire, but of the Lord Jesus. He, 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 he wore that mantle because he understood what God was doing through his ministry. I even, I even, Philippians is my favorite book. He says, you know what? By, go, by them throwing me in the prison, it actually made other saints bolder, is what he said. <clears throat> Chapter one, he goes, it turned out for a furtherance of the gospel. The Romans kept caught in their craftiness messing with me. So now he says, I, if I'm here, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. It's, it's working for your sake. That's what, he, he, that's what he's saying. He started understanding fully, okay, I get it now. And all the time, he's ringing up fruit unto his account, right? Join heirs with Christ, so be that we suffer with him, that we might also be glorified together. Let's, let's end in our text. Go back to 1 Thessalonians 5. <clears throat> so it's through the mystery of Christ that you will be preserved blameless in your whole spirit, soul, and body. But it's a long process. <clears throat> it's a continual process. It's unto the day of Christ. It's something that never, you never uh, complete. Unless you're like Paul, which we're not. We're not the apostle. The Lord in 2 Timothy told Paul, you're done. You strive more when you get close, closer to it. Yeah. I'm a witness of that. You're a witness of that, though. <laughs> Nine years, girl. But you know what Paul said? Faith was he that calleth you who also do it. If you allow God to do it, he'll do That's it. Right. That's right. And, and, and Paul understood when the Lord says, you finish your course, Paul. <clears throat> uh, you fought a good fight. You finish your course. You kept the faith. I was laughing. This uh, quarterback, Peyton Manning, when he retired, one of the best quarterbacks in NFL history, won Super Bowls and stuff. At his uh, Hall of Fame speech, he actually quoted that. I was cracking. He says, through tears, he says, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. <laughs> I was cracking up. I go, you just took that out of context. But I get it. Not football. You know. <laughs> that was funny. Happens but Paul, time, what Paul? I know. It happens all the time. All fight the for context. good fight. Yeah. Labor of love. Labor of love. <laughs> I can do all things. Yeah. Before I even knew it, I, I was playing baseball. Guys would sign Philippians 4, uh, 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 13 on baseball. I can do all things. I remember asking a guy that. Anyway. The point is here is that God is going to do this process. Now, what we're going to see, if you look with me, verse number uh, 12. First Thessalonians 5, we'll, we'll, we'll end in this passage. Verse, verse 12, and we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor, this is true labor, this is ministry, labor among you and are what? Over you and the Lord. There is, the point of the local assembly is for accountability, right? It's part of the process, that's what I wanted to end there. Part of the process of being uh, blameless is that God has instilled a local assembly to help guide that, do the, help you do the work. Because notice he says, verse 12, and we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. That's the warning and the teaching. And to esteem them, notice, very highly in what? Love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourself. Paul understood <clears throat> that the main purpose of the local assembly, it's the place that's going to help you preserve you holy, blameless, for. That's what the local assembly is designed to do. It's where the teaching goes forth, but also where we keep one another, we hold them to, into account, okay? That's the importance of local ministry. It will help you not to stray. It'll help you stay on course. It is, it is constant learning and keeping uh, current with the doctrine, you know, you constantly learn it. It keeps the process going, and 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 that's what the main purpose of the local assembly to keep that that pr preservation going. Uh, Paul, Why does he use feeble-minded in this context? Who uh, would the feeble-minded be? Those who don't. You no, know, different folks have different uh, uh, levels of intellect and understanding and so forth. Okay. Those who probably don't, who don't have, not uh, mature in Christ. yeah, they 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 may not grasp things as quick as others. Because yeah. that sounds negative. 
Well, it says comfort the feeble-minded. Yeah. God, God recognized that, that, is, that that's, that's in humanity. It's part of the curse, right? Part of the curse, yeah. So, so we deal with that graciously. We comfort them. We say, you know. Dodie, in a way, I, I've had, I have people come up to me, and, and I'll end this because I was going to quit. Chris, you remember Brother Craig from uh, Minnesota, right? Mm -hmm. Every year he'd say, he said, Brother Ron, I'd read that passage at home, and then I'd come to the church, and you'd be in that passage I was reading, and you gave me so much more understanding than I had on my own. It's that, it's that, his, his mind, and he'll tell you, he's like, when I read, I couldn't grasp slow this. Down. Yeah, a little more slow. And, and you, help, you help them with the doctrine and so forth. Yeah. Okay? So he's actually being kind there when he says comfort them. You're not putting them down. You, 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 you remember, uh, I remember Jim back in the day said the same thing too. B Big Jim, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happened? He thought he was going <laughs> to, anyway. Yeah, you got to have that humility too. All right, um, but I just wanted to show you that uh, if you have a local assembly within two hours of you, it's a blessing. A lot of us come from far distances. And uh, like our, our visitor here, uh, Sister Madison, she said, yeah, you don't, she looked around, there's no Grace Churches, we already knew that, you just found out. We have folks come from far away, okay? So you just joined the club, but uh, we're so happy to have you here today, we're yeah. really thankful. But uh, yeah, I mean, we're here, she, she called and says, are we open, you know, because they got the lockdown, you know, especially in the Bay Area, and in LA County, everything's shut down, but no, we're, we're going to meet here. Trust in the Lord, and we're going to keep doing the Lord's work <clears throat> until he comes, right? Um, and, and that's the same prayer Paul has. I pray, God, our whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a process, and it's a slow process. It's slow and steady. But if you allow God to do it, he'll do it. All right, let's pray. Well, if, you, if you're listening and you never trusted the Lord Jesus, now is your time. He died for your sins on that cross. Everything we have is because of what the Lord did at Calvary, okay? And we just need to trust them by faith, no works of our own right now. Salvation from hell is, is, is faith. Grace through faith plus no works. Now the good works come after you're saved, but that's a process too, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for um, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the blessing of, of knowing him. Uh, but, but Father, the blessing of knowing him uh, is not just a one-time thing. It's a, it's a, it's a long process. Uh, even our apostle Paul, 30 plus years in Christ, he, he, he was just uh, uh, appreciating the, 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 the fullness, the, uh, the, the intensity of knowing the, the Lord Jesus. Uh, and, and we're going we're gonna to take that into eternity. We're going to be learning about our Savior uh, forever. And so we look forward to that. But we do pray right now, Father, because you've given us the mystery doctrine, that if we haven't uh, been focusing on uh, being preserved blameless in our spirit, soul, and body through the doctrine of mystery, May we focus on that now, or refocus on that for those of us who have been. So, Father, we do thank you for this time together. We ask you to bless the rest of our day and our Q&A as well. We ask you all these things in Christ's name. Amen.